podcast, Unsilenced Voices of Young Tibetans. It has been more than 60 years since Tibet experienced a mass exodus, not seen in its history due to Chinese occupation. Since then, Tibetans have gone through various crests and troughs, but in the past few years, with the onset of the COVID pandemic, significant developments have occurred when it comes to Tibet. In this context, today we would like to welcome our gracious guest. She is one of the youth icons in our Tibetan community, an activist, a member of the 17th Tibetan parliament in exile, and an individual who lives to realize the Tibetan dream of a free and democratic Tibet. A sentiment which I personally echo as well. Welcome to our show, Agari uh, so before Okay, so before dwelling more into your personal experiences as a Tibetan, what do you think of the current developments and support echoed by the recently revived all-party Indian Parliamentary Forum for Tibet, where even you played a pivotal role in its revival? On top of this, the introduction of a bill in the U.S. Congress promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act the latter which significantly stresses on the fact that Tibet is not only the Tibetan autonomous area, but includes the Tibetan areas in Chinese demarcated province of Gansu, Sichuan, Xingai, Yunnan. What are your thoughts on that, Namdala? Well, thank you so much for having me, Namdala. Uh, let me begin by offering my greetings, uh, to to the viewers of FNVA's, uh, FNVA's uh, new English video podcast. Uh, I really like the series which says it's unsilenced voices of young Tibetans uh, because I believe that each platform for uh, Tibetans across the free world will get our voices amplified through those platforms. So uh, indeed, uh, I believe that you know you and I are very like truly privileged to experience freedom and democracy, but uh, you know with that, comes a responsibility, as I always say, of ensuring that we speak for our sisters and brothers home who are in fact silenced by the Chinese colonizing uh, colonizing empire. So getting back to your question, uh, let me begin by, uh, let me take up the second part and thank uh, US Representative Jim McGovern and Representative Michael McCall, who actually introduced the bill in the US uh, House of Representatives uh, this year in July, uh, you know, uh, as you said, you know, it's a very significant bill because, you know, it talks about how uh, Tibetans have the right to self-determination. Uh, it talks about how uh, that produced the Chinese uh, government's policies, you know, from exercising any of such right. And furthermore, as you also mentioned about how uh, the entire traditional region of Tibet, not just the so-called uh, Tibetan Autonomous Region and so-called the, the other provinces like Sichuan, Yunnan, Gansu, and Qinghai, that the entire traditional region of Tibet is an occupied country, quote unquote, under the established principle of uh, international law. So I believe that you know it's a very, very significant bill, especially considering the current political international scenario. Uh, you know, it is in fact a confirmation to the actual history uh, contrary to the PRC, People's Republic of China's claim, narrative that Tibet has been historically an inalienable part of China. So, so I believe that you know, it's a very, very uh, momentous landmark uh, bill that has come in. So if I go back to the first one, I believe that you know, the, the new development that is taking place in India, that is the revival of the APIPFT, uh, I believe it's also important because uh, being a Tibetan born in India, uh, uh, what I want to see is such uh, bills and such laws being passed in India as well. You know, we are looking at this huge uh, uh, parliament uh, consisting of about 750 members, if I'm not mistaken, in both the Sabhas. <clears throat> and we have a parliamentary group, which is very, very small in number. You know, honestly, I believe that, you know, it can be a small number. Like in the United States, uh, the parliamentary support for Tibet in number isn't that huge, but in the kind of uh, bills that we have seen passed, you know, I want that reflected in India as well. So, you know, uh, I hope that 
in coming future, there will be uh, uh, you know bills being passed uh, in regards to uh, the Tibet-China conflict, if I can put it that way, you know, because we have had uh, the government of India pass uh, bills for the Tibetan uh, Tibetans in exile, living in India particularly. But I hope that you know, uh, you know, India and government of India will speak strongly about the issue because it is in fact you know pro India, as I always say. I mean, we know that China currently is the largest. It's the biggest, uh, if I can say, confront to the peace, uh, uh, to the sovereignty of India. You know, so uh, this is uh, one issue that India must take up. Government of India must take up for uh, for uh, its own country. Uh, so yeah, uh, I believe that you know those are important issues that we must uh, um, take upon, and I hope that APIPFT under the new leadership will be able to gradually work on those issues. Thank you, Namjula, for sharing the significance of both these bills, and not only the bills, the support that both these parliamentary forums continue to show to us Tibetans. So moving on with the second question, today, as you know, is the International Day of Disappearance. What would you make, make of the status in Tibet with the context of the 11th Pension Lama, Yundin Shirki Nima, because he was abducted on 17 May 1995 by the Chinese government and continues to remain in incognito. Besides yeah. him, a bulk of Tibetans, especially intellectuals, literary groups, religious figures, and even a number of empowered Tibetan statuses remain unknown. So what is your thought on that? Well, this is one of the dangerous scenario, examples of one of the dangerous scenarios inside Tibet. You know, uh, Chinese Communist Party, the PRC leadership, has remained very, very cautious and intolerant uh, towards any sort of voices that has come up against the Chinese Communist Party and its power. So I believe that, you know, even though Gendu uh, Chaginima, Pencha Jumbuche, was a, a very uh, young, in fact, a child of six years old, that individual was very significant politically. They knew that, you know, the existence of this young child itself could uh, turn out to be a threat to them. And because of that, you know, like without any consideration to the international law, in fact, their own Chinese constitution, uh, they decided to literally abduct the child and uh, his uh, parents and his teachers, you know. So uh, this is the true face of Chinese Communist Party. And we have seen that being resembled with any form of uh, activism or any form of voices that we've seen in Tibet, whether it comes to a singer or, uh, say, a, a, a Tibetan who has raised doubt about the freedom of religion or the freedom of expression or freedom of language inside Tibet, like even the case of Tashi Wancho. Before, you know, after his uh, uh, documentary came out on New York Times, uh, we had him missing for a bit. You know, an individual whose uh, story came out in such a wide platform, like New York Times, he went missing for a bit, you know. So this is a scenario of Tibetans inside Tibet, uh, that, you know, there is no accountability towards the Tibetans, uh, towards their family members, you know. You can just go missing one day, and after a few months, perhaps years, the family members find out that, you know, your 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 uh, your family is, has been in prison for all this time, you know. So uh, this is the true Tibet, the real Tibet under the uh, dictatorial Chinese Communist Party. And, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, the international community and the leadership and the United Nations should not be keeping quiet about Tibet uh, or any Tibetan political prisoners or Tibetans who have gone missing and, forced, and falsely being disappeared. Uh, so yeah, when it comes to Tibet activism, uh, enforced disappearance uh, has been one of the issues that we have been constantly raising. And in fact, it is so sad, sad that you know we really don't have a number, or uh, you know, uh, uh, a data of Tibetan Tibetans who have experienced enforced disappearances. We don't know how many Tibetans could be out there, you know, who have experienced that. So uh, yes. Uh, this is one of the reasons, you know, any 
individuals uh, across the world who care for human rights, who cares for equality, who cares for uh, freedom of expression must uh, do their due research on Tibet, take interest in Tibet and see that, you know, uh, things are just not pleasant. Uh, and, you know, the fact that China is such a powerful nation economically uh, does not give them a leverage to be a, a bully, a dictator, and that we must speak up about that. That was very aptly put. And I would like to add how, you know, it, these days it's not only Tibetans. Recently, I think a few months or years back, we also saw how that famous tennis player, the Chinese tennis player. Oh, yeah. China, the government of China cannot bear these intolerant voices. So regardless of whoever you are, if you say something to them, it happens. It has been happening for Tibet since then and continues to do so. But Absolutely. now they're overreaching it. So Absolutely. thank you for putting it very well for us. It was very enlightening. Now, moving on to the next question. Like Now I would like to get a bit more personal about your own life and your experiences. So the question is, what inspired you to be on the ground and work towards the plight of Tibet and the eventual resolution of its occupation by the Chinese government? Well, uh, I always say that... Uh, becoming an activist was never an option for me, you know, uh, as an individual, as a Tibetan uh, born to uh, the Lagyari family, not just Lagyari family, but belonging to family consisting of so many former political prisoners. Uh, you know, the suffering in Chinese prison, ha you know, while growing up was uh, something that we spoke uh, during dinner, you know, during lunch. Uh, I would hear, you know, when uh, my late Pala and our family would gather, you know, we would hear about that, you know, perhaps I was not listening so hard as a young child, but we would constantly hear these topics, you know, how their lives have been and the kind of dreams that, you know, uh, you know all of them held for themselves. So I've always said that and have mentioned that on several platforms that, you know, uh, I never realized how this dream that Pala had held until he passed away, I didn't realize how that became my dream, you know, the freedom of Tibet. And I'm sure that it's an emotion, it's a strong emotion that each young Tibetan shares. We just, you know, it's not a propaganda that has been indoctrinated in us. It's something that is, I would say, ingrained in our blood that we can't escape. You know, a scar, a pain that has brought this life to us. And I, I've said that, you know, perhaps you could share this feeling that, you know, even though you and I haven't seen, you know, uh, straight up uh, torture by Chinese Communist Party or its police or its military uh, power, you know, the fact that you and I, our right to be born our own homeland was snatched away from us is, is painful enough. The fact that, you know, you and I, when we are talking about home, you know, there's a question in our minds. You know, so I think uh, this has inspired me to work. How, you know, this, uh, the life, the, the way I was brought up at home and school and how I saw that pain, that story, that uh, uh, affection, uh, you know, that conviction being uh, uh, replicated in Tibet too. I see young Tibetans inside Tibet uh, with same aspirations. And I say, well, you know, we can't possibly be keeping quiet. You know, as I opened up our discussion, you know, how uh, it's our responsibility as Tibetans in the free world, enjoying this freedom and democracy that Tibetans inside Tibet who are silenced could get their voice being amplified, you know. I, you know, there are many people who say that, uh, you know, Tibetans inside Tibet, uh, they are voiceless. I always say that they have a strong voice, which has been silenced. Well, it's our responsibility and perhaps the responsibility now of FNVA that now it can be opened up. Yeah. Definitely. I think <clears throat> that is what not only FNVA, a lot of Tibetans should follow. 
And a very important point that you mentioned was how, you know, Tibetans are born as act activists. Like, they, even though there is no notion of being an activist, we Tibetans are born in that scenario. And I think that is something that all of us Tibetans go through or we come through this phase. And that's a very interesting point that we raised, that you raised, and on top of which, we also represent the voiceless Tibetans, the countless, the millions of Tibetans currently under the brutal Chinese communist regime. So moving on to the next question, you talked a bit about your family. So I would like to direct my question on that angle. So being from a noble ancestry in the sense that you are one of the few remaining ancestors of the great Tibetan kings of the past, was there any extra burden to you growing up? Or, and what was the outlook from the larger Tibetan community towards you before you establish yourself as an activist, a parliamentarian, and an icon for the Tibetans who cherishes the ideals of democracy? Well, um, for me, raising my identity as a Lhagari, that is a descendant of Tibetan kings, uh, it, uh, you know, I think, I find myself in a difficult position, in a very awkward position, if I can put myself that way, because um, it, is, it is a title that I don't know how it feels like. Uh, I'm saying that because I, I have technically been brought up in TCV, Tibetan Children's Village, where, uh, you know, we, you know, children of every possible background, we come together, we work together, we wear the same uniform, we do our same chores. Uh, so I think this is, uh, you know, more importantly, how our conviction for a free and democratic Tibet is so strong that I believe that, you know, for me, I believe that, you know, of course our history is important because on that basis, we are able to establish a stronger future. But uh, my focus remains on how our history can inspire you to work harder. But then it should be our future that can determine our vision. So for me, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it a burden. Perhaps oh, there could be sleek moments of seconds where I felt like, oh, uh, you know, when, of course, you and I know how difficult it can be uh, for Tibetan youth to work in a Tibetan community, how... Um, the kind of uh, slashing that you face uh, verbally, uh, the kind of uh, discouragement that sometimes you face as you work for the Tibetan community can be so difficult when you question, like, uh, do I want to do this? Do I want to face this in coming years? Is this something that I want to do in coming future? So those are times when I question and perhaps feel like it's a burden. But more importantly, for me, I have, and uh, even my siblings, they've said that, you know, they feel that, it's an extra responsibility that they feel. They feel like even if their friends are taking the liberty of living their lives for themselves, uh, we, in fact, are siblings. We feel like, you know, at least one of us, if not all of us, we have to do something for Tibet. You know, we know that, you know, our late father, you know, he was one of those who saw the military invasion of Tibet and he chose to stand up and fight China's Communist Party. Our family chose to fight that by... Uh, you know, letting go of everything possible that we had. And the story that we heard from our Pala is how he did not care what he lost because he cared more about the future of Tibet. He cared more about the future of the Tibetans and the responsibility that, she, that he shared. And I've always said that being Pala's Pomo, you know, I want to experience that because I am so proud of my late Pala. You know, I felt like, you know, for a person who has been imprisoned for more than 20 years, who has lost everything that he owned and our families have owned for centuries and yet feel no regret, but pride. You know, I've always said that that's a true patriotism and I want to experience that myself. You know, there's not much that I can lose, honestly, because we have been brought up in exile without pretty much any economic uh, background or facilities, but then I know that I have this life that I can contribute for this movement uh, for the Tibetan freedom uh, resistance, and I'm doing just that. And I hope that, uh, you know, uh, 
the Tibetan youth feel sad, you know, uh, it's not about where you are born, born as a Tibetan, which family you are born into. The fact that you are born as a Tibetan, you know, we are born with a responsibility towards this freedom movement, towards the Tibetans inside Tibet, towards each Tibetan who have put their lives on threat inside Tibet, each Tibetan who decides to walk out of the home's threshold to protest against Chinese Communist Party or to speak up about it. They know that they're gonna die. They know that they'll be tortured for years and months, but they did decide to do that for us. So it won't be fair if we decide to just keep quiet and do nothing about it. So for me, yes, it's a responsibility and I'll continue to take that responsibility uh, as long as our, our people want it, yeah. That was a really, you know, a touching narrative, you know, hearing you speak about such things makes me remember about my own grandparents who had to undertake the journey, had to leave everything behind, not because they had something here, but because they did not feel right what China did to us there. They had occupied our land, you know, not only occupied our land, they enforced us many things, they took away our rights. So. The conviction that they showed to us, I think we youngsters and the generations of Tibetans born in exile should carry that forward. And one thing that you said really, that you said was really interesting was how, you know, being a youth and also I would mention a woman in a Tibetan community standing up, speaking against, in a way, the establishment is very hard. But I believe like we can see people, individuals like you and other Tibetans are really rising up to the challenge and I hopefully would I hopefully see that a change, an imminent change is coming. So thank you for sharing us. Uh, so my next question would lie around the future of Tibet. So my question is, what is the vision of Tibet and Tibetans you see in, let's say, 20 years down the line, during which, obviously, the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama would be at the forefront then? Uh, well, uh... One thing that I've mentioned again and again, uh, especially to Tibetan youth, is the fact that we are so obliged, we are so thankful to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama because he gave us the opportunity, give, gave us the platform, gave us a chance to be a person, to be an individual, to be a change maker, you know, he, you know, this democracy, I think it's, an, it's something that I've heard so many people say that, you know, we have seen revolutions, we have seen mass murder, murders for democracy and for the Tibetans, you know, you know, we often say that, you know, it's a gift and truly it is. So, you know, we should not take that for granted. A the gift of democracy that His Holiness uh, gave us, you know, we always say that it, it's from 2011. Uh, or it's in 2001 that His Holiness gave us the political power. But uh, when you actually study the uh, demographic, when you actually study the exile uh, Tibetan democracy, you realize how His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama has been uh, giving us practice of democracy. How he usually would, uh, what he's done is uh, allowed the Tibetans to elect our own, uh, say, members of parliament increased the number, uh, gave opportunity to women, uh, reserved seats for Tibetan women parliamentarians to ensure that our voices are co come in, uh, decision making as well. Then we saw like uh, the section of Tibetan Buddhist sects like Pimbo, their voices could come in. So all I want to say is, you know, gradually then partial political power was given. Then uh, in 2011, the entire political power was given. The reason why I'm raising that is because His Holiness, what he's done is ensure that we uh, gradually get used to decision making, uh, get used to becoming change makers. So uh, it's our responsibility uh, to make sure that Tibet comes as a strong power. Tibet remains an important topic on international platform. Uh, it's important, you know, uh, right now, many of us say that what will happen to us, what will happen to Tibet, what will happen to uh, Tibetans inside Tibet without His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. But I've said 
And I believe that, you know, His Holiness at 14 Dalai Lama is in India, is able to travel everywhere across the world except Tibet at the moment. So Tibetans inside Tibet, without the direct influence of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, has done and continue to do so much for Tibetan freedom movement through inspiration, through his words. So what I want to say is uh, when we reach a post-Dalai Lama scenario, uh, I hope and pray that His Holiness will stay till 113, even more. But we have to be realistic. We have to understand that there will be a time when we will see that. However, we should not be just, you know, idly and just waiting for that scenario or, uh, you know, situation. We should be preparing ourselves for our community to be self-sufficient, you know, to have his holinesses as inspiration, but then become our own voices. So, uh, it's a difficult position. Uh, Chinese Communist Party understands that, uh, you know, it's a very delicate uh, scenario that could lead to complete dysfunction of the exile government. But we must not allow that uh, dream of Chinese Communist Party and its uh, leadership. Hence, what we have to do is we must... Uh, come together, we must come together as a community, we must come together as disciples of, of uh, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama and make sure that we continue to work for Tibet Freedom Movement and make sure that Tibetan government in exile becomes the voice of Tibetans inside Tibet. Because regardless of changes of any political leadership, we know that the exile Tibetan government will remain. Hence, if we make Tibetan government in exile, central Tibetan administration as the true voice of Tibetans inside Tibet, we will be able to ensure that the weight and the importance of the Tibetans inside Tibet and the freedom movement will continue to sustain and in fact uh, grow stronger than ever before. And we know that after His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, we will have a 15th Dalai Lama who will continue to inspire us again in different modes. So let us all be uh, optimistic. Let us all be strong. Let us all continue to work honestly instead of being scared and intimidated by a scenario, which for me seems uh, rather far away at the moment. That was really interesting, you know, the optimism that Tibetans need to garner from their past experiences and put it forward rather than looking pessimistic, especially the point that when you mentioned how, you know, like that His Holiness in his own way since coming to exile, he was trying to impart democracy into Tibet. Like Absolutely. I think it was 1960, right? Yes. Uh, I think in the coming days, we are going to celebrate the Democracy Day as well on 2nd September. September. 2nd. So, yes. We have a long legacy of democracy since coming to exile. And definitely, I think we Tibetans must be more positive on that note. And confident. Yeah, confident as well. So, yeah, like now I would like to share my penultimate question. It is something that I've noticed in the past few years, you know. I felt how popular slogans used by us Tibetans during the peaceful marches that are allowed in India, fortunately, like, the freedom of Tibet, security of India, we refer to it as Tibet ki azadi, Bharat ki suraksha. This has been getting more traction and in a way, I feel it has become mainstream in a sense. And sure. as we can see, as we can see the support by the API FT and the Prime Minister of India openly wishing his holiness, the Dalai Lama, during his birthday yeah. shows a certain shift occurring in the narrative of Tibet in India. So what are your thoughts on this? And do you see India, in a way, finally putting its foot down on China, saying, like, enough is enough now, you know? Well, I hope that is the scenario. I hope that is the case. Um, I've seen the people of India come together. I've seen the people of India come in solidarity very strongly with people of Tibet, uh, the Tibet movement. Uh, and uh, the Sino-Tibet conflict, if I can put it that way. Uh, but sadly enough, I'm not sure if I can say that I've seen the government uh, done uh, so much 
for Tibet cause. Of course, you know, when it comes to uh, the providing support for Tibetan diaspora, uh, humanitarian support, social education support, they have been more than kind to us. But we know that the reason we are in exile is not just for us. The reason we are here is for Tibetans inside Tibet. Uh, hence, uh, you know, I feel like the leadership of uh, the Union of India should be doing more than what it has been doing. As I mentioned earlier in the opening, I hope that in coming years we'll see policies, we'll see act being, uh, you know, put up in the parliament for Tibet. You know, I hope that India really understands the entire politics and understands that, you know, when it comes to China, Tibet can be a big card. You know, when it comes to China, uh, that is the strongest threat for, uh, you know, India at the moment. The only way that India can win this is through the allyship with the government, Tibetan government in exile. So sadly enough, um, if I can put it honestly, I feel like not much has been done. And many should be done, ought to be done. So especially considering the kind of aggression that we are looking at, uh, the kind of military aggression that Chinese Communist Party has been shamelessly carrying at uh, Indo-Tibet border, you know, I believe at least if not for us, if not for the Tibetans, if not for the Tibetans inside Tibet, but for the sovereignty and security of India, government of India perhaps should do more, speak more, show more than what it has been doing. So let's see, I hope that uh, the leadership, uh, the elected leadership of India could see that the people of India are with the Tibetans and the Tibet cause. So uh, I hope that, you know, we'll be able to see more happening from the government side. Definitely. I hope, as you said, we can see more. And recently, I, I think even you are aware of this fact, but in the United Nations, Security Council, I guess it was the Indian representative, you know, in a slightly funny manner, sort of mentioned China, how they should respect the territorial integrity, in a way mentioning the border conflict and showing how India is also changing its stance, you know? Without so I believe China. we can... Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> well, it's difficult in a way, but I think we they are moving in the right direction. I think we can agree on that part. Well, so at least it, uh, it's a small step. It's a small step, and I'm very happy about it. But considering the real scenario, uh, I wish for more. You know, I wish yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, it could go beyond wishing His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama on his birthday. I wish that it could be more about uh, the leadership, the parliamentary leadership of India attending our, uh, you know, events allowing us to organize events in, instead of seeking approval from China's Communist Party. You know, uh, I'm more than grateful for every opportunity that the government of India and the people of India has provided us, you and I. But, you know, what about Tibetans inside Tibet? And this issue is not just for them, as I said, it's pro-India. Definitely. And the things that you mentioned, I think they will definitely hear from this and make sense of it more. I hope so. Yeah. And so, yeah, now this is going to be my last question. You know, we have had a pretty good session till now. So before wrapping it up, I would like to request you whether you have any messages to our Tibetan sisters and brothers and also to the scores of individuals, organization and support groups who constantly continues to support and stand by us Tibetans. Absolutely. You know, I remain grateful to each Tibetan people, each Tibet support groups, organizations, individuals who have been standing with us for so many decades. I know that, you know, each one of them, the kind of sacrifices that they have to put in, you know, it's not, uh, it's not an easy decision when an individual say that I want to be a Tibet supporter, the kind of time that you have to assure, uh, you know, allocate for this movement, the kind of energy, uh, that you have to put in and I think it's just not easy at all so I remain more than grateful that uh, you know we have had such strong and powerful and dedicated groups 
of Tibet support groups and uh, Tibet uh, supporters, individual supporters across the world. Uh, and I hope that you know, through them, we are able to have, have more individuals who can understand the Tibet issue more, who can understand how this Tibet-China conflict uh, matters to them as well, that it's not just about us, the Tibetans, but it's about uh, you know, uh, the international relations and how that impacts their country, them as an individual too. So yes, um, I want to say just, just please don't give up. You know, I know that Chinese Communist Party, it's powerful at the moment, but we also know the true story, how things are falling apart from the center for Chinese Communist Party, how within the Chinese Communist Party, there are so many individuals who are very, in a very uncomfortable position about the leadership of Xi Jinping. And there are so many Chinese themselves who are gradually speaking up against them. And we have our allies from the Uyghur community, from the Southern Mongolian community, from the Taiwanese, Hong Kongers. They are there and we are all working together. And to be able to win against a mighty uh, ruler, mighty dictator, you know, it's only possible if we work together. So thank you so much and please don't give up. Let's all work together and so that you know, we see a victory. You know, if not today, uh, in coming years, we'll be able to see a free Tibet. We'll be able to see a free Uzbekistan and free Southern Mongolia and a free China. In fact, <laughs> I think you know, even the Chinese themselves need to be free for themselves and their future. So uh, let's continue to work together and support each other and continue to give platforms to each other and the, uh, the Tibetan youth. And for the Tibetan youth, I want to say, you know, uh, it, it's not, it won't be fair if we live our lives just for ourselves, uh, considering the opportunities, considering the facilities that we have received compared to our predecessors, compared to our parents, our grandparents, more so the Tibetans inside Tibet. It's not fair if we just live for ourselves and our own future and our own profession, you know. We've got to be doing more than what we are and what, you know, like in coming future, we will be able to see a change together you know, a change of a free and democratic Tibet. So let's just not give up. Thank you so much, Lagiri Namgyudovala, for taking time from your busy schedule. I think people mm -hmm. must be know that, like, in the coming days, you have your own parliament session, right? So just <laughs> taking out time, coming here at FNVA for this podcast, it was very, you know, I feel very grateful towards you and, I thank you for the engaging conversations that we had today. And I think we can learn from these and move ahead, you know, to the right path. Absolutely. So thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to you and all the best for the coming uh, episodes. Thank you. Uh -huh.